Good morning to you, my friends, wherever you may be in the world today. Alan Clements here from Maui, Hawaii, United States of America. Today, August 5th, 2021, today's sharing uh, a personal reflection, uh, my life, um, the last year, wild ride. My life this last year, I was going to say lessons learned, but that's way too dramatic. Lessons learning, lessons in process. Uh, so if I may, in my normal style, extemporaneously just dive and play in this sonic collage of heart and information, meaning, definition, a meditation, a poem, um, you know, a love affair between you and me and me and me and me and God and goddess. Uh, in this vast, crazy mystery of interbeing, living. So uh, nice to see you today. I'm honored to say that on Sunday at 9.30, uh, here in Hawaii, I will have my special guest, uh, Stephen M. Shore, back, and we will talk about the edge of the pandemic uh, in the most honest, courageous way possible to illuminate new ways of engaging this radical phenomena, the pandemic, and uh, dealing with the therapeutic, the plant, the herbal, the psychic intuitive, the resistance, resistance, activism, biological activism, medical activism, spiritual activism, Dharma activism, what we can do to turn back this totalitarian wave that seems to be coming in through every flat screen and news media source and in our ears and eyes, we will win. So welcome to today. Uh, my last year and lessons in process, <laughs> lessons in process. I wrote them down. I, I'd like to just, if I may, just state them in a uh, simple way and then dive into them. Um, well, let me provide, you know, the last year, the context for me, uh, my beloved country of Burma, I was in Bali for nearly eight months. After that, of course, nearly a year prior to Burma, also in Bali, but Burma, Bali, Los Angeles for nearly a year. And here I am on the island of Maui for nearly a month. Um, many of you know that I've written a book this last year called Extinction X-Rated. Uh, last October with my colleague Fergus Harlow, we delivered four books called Burma's Voices of Freedom, the voices of former political prisoners, and now many of them returned to the prison based on Ming Online, the satanic evil um, terrorist leader of Burma. And I bring these contexts up. It's been a challenging year for all of us, speaking on a personal level. The collapse of Burma, the incarceration of my friend Da Aung San Suu Kyi and many other friends, the decimation of democracy in that country, and the radical inspiration of ethical, spiritual, mindful courage. It's just so over the top, but it's broken my heart. But in that breaking, there has been the releasing of more intense forms of courage and resilience. Um, being in Bali, a, a chance to be deeply in nature. Many of you know I've told and said many times, I took my shoes off for nearly eight months and just communed and at times dosed in various forms and meditated, did yoga, primarily lived on my own and just communed. It was a powerful experience. I came back to the United States primarily to see my beloved daughter, Bella, 14 and a half, who had now gone to Mexico and blessed that she lived on the beach with many of her friends and her mother and had a splendid time. I was blessed to see her when she returned to Canada, stopped in Los Angeles for 12 hours. We had an enormously beautiful time. And here I am on Maui. Now within all of this, I won't dwell on this, there was 
a collapse of lots of things. I lost my mother and father, my three best male friends. Uh, can't even speak about the loss of Burma. And at the same moment, the resurrection of hope because these people never give up and I refuse to ever give up. Um, and then there was the diagnoses of this acutely enlarged, as I was told, uh, aortic aneurysm, the largest vessel out of the heart with uh, a prognosis of, of, of a ticking bomb with a short fuse, unless there was this radically dangerous open heart surgery, which many of you know, I won't dwell on it, have chosen not to undergo. And it's been a radical time. And here I am today, August 5th, 2021. And I've decided as I woke up this morning and meditated, you know, I would want to, what have I learned? What am I learning? And so if I may, let me just list, I think there's about 13 points. Number one, I wrote, and only at the last second, treat yourself, Alan, like you are in love. <laughs> I know that's so new agey and so cliched, almost a TED talk. Treat yourself, be in love. Don't seek the love that you're missing, you know. Be in radiant love. I call it nothing missing dharma. And how easy it is to live in the conditioning, the narratives of missing. And I'm not saying go into full blossom spectrum fullness, unless that's your enlightenment and that's what you wish to be. But there's something so beautiful. We are people embedded in, a, in, an, in an existence. None of us are complete without food and rest and shelter. We're so deeply interrelated. So it's very, very complicated to state, be in the fullness that you are, overcoming missing dharma, to be in love, to be in love, doesn't mean that you're full, it just means that you're radiating from the inside through. And there's something in that. Take nothing for granted. You think it's bad, I said this to my, you think it's bad, Alan, it can get worse. And at the same time, there's a part of me that just says, fuck it, no obstacle. And at the same time, the role of dark satire and humor and laughter, no one can imprison your mind and your conscience and your dignity. No one can take the levity and the humor and the satire from your soul. Nothing will, nothing can, unless you let it. It's all a state of mind. And I wrote just at the last little addendum, it's all a state of mind. Yes, 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 yes. It's all a state of mind, but how real it is. So it's a very fine balance between the confluence of owning interiority and choosing states of consciousness, the beautiful Chaitasikas, at the same time, right at that edge of human vulnerability and perception at the confluence of consciousness in context at the sense doors and all postures, there is life and life is intense. Old age, disease, catastrophic unexpected circumstances, asteroids, climate change, ethnic cleansing, catastrophic human insults, judgment, blame, a bad relationship, a love affair that's gone south, all of a sudden you're diagnosed with something. So to say it's all a state of mind, Alan, isn't really fair, but to empower that choice-making capacity of consciousness to engage the best of you. Root yourself in conscience and in dignity. I could talk a lot about that, but there's something in this process for me of rootedness, the lesson of rootedness. You know, I do standing yoga, standing meditation. Sometimes I'm aware of my body. Sometimes I'm aware of my breath. But a lot of the time in my meditation, maybe this is true for you as well, 
I am, I am occupying the invisibility yet the tangible quality of conscience. There's something about conscience, the navigation of truth from fiction, right from wrong. It's imbued with the intelligence of a moral assessment of the appropriateness or the skillfulness or the suitability of something, that deep reasoning, inquiring, questioning state of conscience. Rooting, yes, but no, occupying the lungs of our soul, fill with conscience, in breath, conscience, out breath, conscience, in breath, conscience, out breath, fearlessness, in breath, dignity, out breath, shame, in breath, conscience, out breath, dignity. Hmm. Looks like we're back. Uh, the internet here is having a little bit of a stressed out experience, but let me continue. The restorative power of nature. The elements, the wind, the air, the light, the frequencies, the particles, the waves, the prism of the human mind and body to illuminate the aspects of light within the color spectrum of shared being in this great mystery. To feel our nature, to feel air and breathe it, to take our time that we are embedded living entities within the field of the elemental. There's something so restorative about the nutrients of the elements, including food and water. It's not just to drink mindfully and to drink and to eat and to cook and to prepare as consciously as possible, but the innateness of the body as a field of, of an organism that lives based upon nature. It is nature and to occupy that nature with a restorative, natural, organic organ. I want to use the word lens, but the organ of restoration, the body as an organ, not just the heart or the lungs. Um, creating a sacred space. Having been in, I don't like using the word lock down, but the encouragement to stay within home and vicinity to minimize the spread of the COVID. Creating a sacred space, regardless of a pandemic. There's something so rare in our ability as humans to have the privilege, if you will, to make our environment an expression of our Christ, to make our home an expression of our goddess, to make our home an expression of our temple, a temple, to make it reflective of the aesthetics of your own unique expression of Dhamma. Your Van Gogh, your Rembrandt, your Ellen, your Sophie, your Janine, your Marsha, your Mitch, your Kathy, your Catherine, your Summer. You, 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 not Christian alone or Buddhist alone or Hindu, but you as the icon of liberation. That's what I'm saying about making home a reflection of our souls, not necessarily symbolic, if you will, of our religions or our spirituality or the iconography of our Dharma.
disciplined regularity. There's something about monastic life that has stayed with me in the order of a disciplined regularity in terms of creating and supporting an ease of being within the complexity of the, you know, the day. Some order or discipline on how much you eat, when you eat, how you eat, where you eat, with whom you eat, how you wash, how you bathe, how you shower, when you shower, where you place what you use, when you use it, how you go about the, 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 the conscious sacrament, if you will, of consecrating your aspirations for freedom, your practices, your trainings, the art of your livelihood, your vocation, the professionality of how you go about writing, gardening, being in your psychotherapeutic relationships, either in person or through media, how you go about your living. A disciplined regularity isn't a militancy. It's seeing the wisdom of order, the wisdom of discipline and the repetition and the muscling and the strengthening that comes from a conscious choice-making regularity. I like going to bed now at a certain time in a vicinity at this stage of life because it gives me time to meditate throughout the night, not necessarily sleep. Disciplined regularity. I can't say enough over the last two years, especially the last year, um, being in Los Angeles and writing, creating, the role for me of sound. And I distinguish between toxic sounds, motorcycles, airplanes, cars. There's something about that that's, you know, I know it, I, it's just so sensitive to the millions and billions of people that live in environments, environmental circumstances where toxicity is just the norm, the noise, the noise, the noise. And I feel for these people and I feel for my own circumstances. I'm just gone crazy here with these fucking roosters all over this island going off all night long. It's just insane. Like they're just like reborn again. Hindus just chanting in animal forms. No, no offense, no wrong. Don't judge. It's just bad humor. But these God damn roosters everywhere. Oh, you get used to them, do you? Sleep deprivation, you get used to. Your cognitive functions are diminished. And it's like having a motorcycle outside your door. It's annoying and you got to really challenge that place in you and you begin to see samsara. You can't control it. Anatta, emptiness of control. What you do have control of, Alan, which you encourage people to do, is it's all a state of mind. But the confluence of the rooster and the confluence of the man next door who screams at his son, and all you want to do is just wring his neck and you find these convulsions within the samsaric shared tapestry. And you go, come back home, Alan. It's in the middle of the night. He has every right to yell at his son. And I imbue his as not mine. And I go like, God, I want to go there and write a note on his soul and put a high dose of mindful Valium in his mind to quiet the rage, but all of this theatrics will never work. In breath, out breath, relax, relax, sound. Now what I'm speaking to here is the role of consciously choosing auditory vibration, sound, frequency, music, voice, poetry, the orchestration of information, the lyrical, beauty of language, the spoken word, film. Chanting. Singing. 
moving the body to the rhythm of your artists that you love and playing over and over and over and over again songs that really move your spirit, yes? Include the auditory wave of elevation, the revolution of the heart through sound and music. And for me personally, I've really gotten into not just chanting for repetition's sake, but chanting as a verbal, sonic, meditative, vibrational inclusivity of my entirety. And now that I'm practicing more of singing, I'm really realizing how you can fill your entire body up with vibratory restoration. And so I encourage those who are inclined to include in your repertoire of survival the beauty of conscious voice, poetry, singing, and uh, the music of your own uniqueness, whatever that may be. Nine, many of you know, in the book that I released recently, Extinction X-Rated, was written in the home of my beloved friends, Robert and Jennifer Chartoff. Uh, they were dear, dear friends. She is a beloved friend as well. She survived her husband, Robert, Bob. I know Bob from the 1980s when he attended a number of my retreats near Los Angeles. We went to Burma together, to India. He was a beloved friend and mentor and ally, a, a creative savant, tell a beautiful And we're back, one of those days where Wi-Fi has got a mind of her own. Talking about my friend Robert Chardoff and the point here, lessons learning, um, Having done the Rocky movies and writing this book, Extinction X-Rated, the core or the archetypal theme as I feel it and hear it in the movie, Rocky, and as Bob explained to me so many times throughout our long, long relationship, was never give up. There is no obstacle, physical, emotional, psychological, existential, that one cannot challenge. In other words, do not comply, right? Do not cower, do not comply with the so-called overlords or the architects of evil, totalitarianism, authoritarianism, dictatorship, and even the the cult of shame and worry and self-abuse and minimizing our own worth inside, those deeper forms of totalitarian structures that must be challenged, never give up. And I'm right now, many of you know, I've been speaking about, I'm writing a play, a one-person play. Yes, I will direct it, I will produce it, I'm going to be the sort of star right in the center of, but I'm writing a play and the theme of it is fight. I've learned anything this last year, this last two years, this last three years, this last four years, these 70 years is identical to never give up. It's about the journey, no doubt about it. And that journey is filled with Grand Canyon depth crevasses. There is no way easy to integrate diagnoses on a physical, psychological, mental, emotional level where it interrupts your entire flow. I mean, I can tell you from a firsthand experience back on April 11th, being diagnosed in an emergency room in Los Angeles with a fatal heart disease, if I didn't get immediate open heart surgery, which in itself is radically dangerous, just like that, packed, ready to go back to Bali, and classic life interrupted, and I'm, thinking about my friend Bob. And here it is on August 5th, almost four months after that diagnosis, and I've never felt more empowered to fight. The war is on, not just with my own belief of mortality, yes, that's one dimension, but it's so much more than that. It's the fight against authoritarianism. It's the epic revolutionary place in all of us that wants to stand up 
to false authority, the cowards with big, boasting, bloated minds and sociopathic chests, Xi Jinping in China, Putin in Russia, at times in our own government. But we're not a totalitarian government, we're a neurotic democracy. I love being in America. I love being able to speak and play and create theatrical formations that challenge the establishment. But in Burma, in China, if I'm doing this and saying this, I'll be in the gulag like the boys and girls in Hong Kong being thrown away for nine years, 10 years, life in prison and the world stands and watch the normalization of that shit. But we've got to learn to fight. It isn't just to fight our own personal battle, but to fight the good fight for the freedom of other people. So Bob, thank you for that core archetypal transformational mantra. No obstacle, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual, existential, religious, human, cosmological, galactic will get in the way between me and me. You can take my breath, you can take my oxygen, you can take my life, you can take all of my belongings, but you cannot take in my own relative human way, my self-identity, my worth, my conscience, my dignity. Yeah, go for it, right? What else is it? The fight is on. That was Bob. Rise up. So that lesson that I'm learning, despite the hardships, pick your butt up, Alan. Take a shower, do a little bit of yoga, drink some wine, keep the cigarette out of your mouth, no pharmaceuticals, walk, exercise when you're feeling it, rave on, scream to the Holy Spirit. Someone said that. Dylan Thomas? Not sure. 10. And it goes intimately into the soul of never giving up, vulnerability. I tell you, I know a lot of people know about vulnerability. I've had my hardships, but this last year, this last three months, this last four and a half months, poof, the shock diagnoses of fatality, death, and an epic dangerous operation. And if it were to rupture this aneurysm, the images, the people I've spoken to who've survived it, an epic horror. And so this multiple invenerating sense of impending doom and vulnerability has been my goddess. If I let you know, and I share it with humility and crying has become my friend. I don't know why I cry. I don't know why you cry. I don't know why you think you cry. Someone asked me about a post that I put up about the inevitability of crying and somehow associating sadness to that. There is a kind of primordial conditioning. I responded to this perception that crying is somehow connected to sadness, but it was a very interesting, elegant, existential prodding invitation as I felt it to feel more into the naturalness of the tear. Sanctify, sanctify, imbue with love and beauty the naturalness of the processes of being human. Live in love. Be the chemistry of enlightenment that you seek. Vulnerability. I'm not sure that it lacks power when I cry. I really don't. And I've stopped somewhat trying to analyze the why the last four months, well, the last year and a half, well, the last two, three years. Cried so much with my dad dying and my mom dying, loss of a relationship, the complexities with my daughter. friends dying, the eco trauma and grief associated with my perception of the collapse of our precious climate and the environment, the desecration, the death of the oceans. If the waves could speak, what would they say to us? If the oceans could cry, 
how would we distinguish water from tears if the birds not only sang, but they wept as they flew over the epic death of our fish and whales and coral reefs. If the molecules of light and photons could speak, what would they say to us about our behavior in New York and Philadelphia and Shanghai and Melbourne? The interrelatedness of this, this itness <laughs> makes you cry. It's a vulnerable circumstance. It is so vulnerable. It is so epic. It is beyond words. And at times all you can do is go fuck it and cry and take me yet again into the grave of eternity allow me to resurrect in my own slow embryonic growth through my mother's womb into a man, into a body, into a voice, and to do it again and again and again and again in a cut and a bug and a fever and malaria and death and a genocide and apocalypse, a nuclear war, and all of a sudden it is so vulnerable. I don't know how humans and animals and birds and the earth keeps repeating cyclic evolutional, cyclic evolutional poetry over and over and over again. Vulnerability. Could we ever say enough about it? The power of the tear, the poetry of the weep, the crying for salvation. Eleven for me, I don't know what order is non-postponement. If I've learned anything, if I'm learning anything, if I'm learning anything today in my own rave scream poetry to invite myself to be bigger and better and more open, don't postpone. I am so down with action, action, action. Even stillness is a dynamic action, but I'm a believer in taking the thought into action almost, one more step, immediately. But having the discernment, right, to know when to interrupt the thought, the speech, and the action because it's not profitable or suitable for you or beneficial for the other. So action isn't always doing, 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 doing. It's the action sometimes of pure listening and being in the front row of your existence with your lover, with your God, with your holiness, non-postponement. I occupy the truth of my highest radiance now, 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 now. How well can we live not only now, but an elongated now that includes the joy of anticipation because when I feel anticipation and the poetry of that, I feel like I want to get into the action of preparation and the dance of the aesthetic and the artistry and the perfume and the makeup and the love and the clothes. I'm going to a dinner on Sunday and I'm anticipating a great romance. Non-postponement, living in bliss, living in joy, living in vulnerability, living in the poetry of diversity. Moving along here, otherwise I'll just go on and on and on. The value of the bigger picture, and I've got one more after that. The value of the bigger picture. Take me, God, when you do. So be it. Because I've got my eyes like telescopes into the heavens of my own soul, into the universe of endless diversity, and I am going to reflect on the bigger picture. I live on this blessed little micro dot in the middle of the Pacific, which is really just this gargantuan mountain, an active volcano called Haleakala. You can't see it, but you can see the rim of it way up there. There's a telescope on there that goes way out into infinity. When I was in Bali, and sometimes when I'm walking out at night here, you go, oh, the MG goes on. Oh my God, this is like, whoa, we are in a neighborhood 
of infinite diversity and complexity. And I scream out the takeaway for me in this bigger picture reflection is, you know, we're not alone. We're not just some aberrant species embedded on this, this, this blue green oceanic eco interconnected sphere orbiting a sun star in a solar system the psychedelic, the meditative, the yogic, multi-dimensionality, the valiance of consciousness that begins to perceive entities and deities and devas and angels and demonic energies embodied in forms, all of it's there and we're not alone. And out there at the universe, the unidentified aerial phenomenon but those of us who have done the psychedelic and meditated, we know, we know, we feel, we occupy coexistence. We're not alone. The bigger picture. Sometimes I invite you when all else not fails, but when you're feeling it, walk outside and reflect anew. Sometimes I go out and it's terrifying to look out there. Oh my God, my little three pound brain encased in this six foot one inch long organic organ, blood oxygenated body. Who are we? Where are we? So may I invite you in one of my lessons I'm learning Keep that big picture. Keep whatever big means to you and keep that word picture as a luminant, cinematic, felt experiential wonderment. Feel wonderment as a nutrient on the palate of one's own awakening, not as a thought alone. And the last, and there's so many others, this is one that's come to me over the years that I find very inspiring. Yes, I fear death. Yes, I fear the loss of being connected to my family and friends and my daughter. I anticipate their suffering more than my own pain. Yes, 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 I'm mortal, I'm human. But sometimes I pause and break the coma of being present in the now alone and allow myself the, the spectacle of existential serendipity in the past. And look upon as far as my own heart's vision can see and feel history, the multiple billions of homo sapiens that we never know the name of from all countries, all regions, all times as far back as life could be, family. We're of this, this evolutional species and every one of them in their own way led to the interrelatedness of this, this type of human, holistic, holographic mandala called the evolution of our species in the context of the ecosystem with all nature, with all other non-humans. And here I sit reflecting back and I'm going like, oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you, mother and father. Thank you, grandparents. Thank you, all relatives. Thank you, all forms of life. Thank you, nature. Thank you, God. Thank you, all things that have ever led to this moment now to be who I am. All of you women who fought and struggled and protested the desecration of the limitations of your freedom to protest apartheid and supremacy and all the ways in which we discriminate, all the wars that have been fought in the name of democracy and freedom, the good fight. How many people went ashore onto these infinite beaches of Normandy throughout all wars knowing that they had 19 seconds to keep alive the power of conscience and dignity and the fight 
they would never be known. Their bodies would never be found. And they're dead, and we never honor them. So when I take this last point I'm learning, reflecting on life, the future of life, it goes right back to the past. That isn't really past. It's just an information mandala informing us of who we are. So may I invite you to invite me to invite our friends out of compassion for our own life. Let's pay honor to all life, all people, known and unknown, that have led to this moment now. And here I'll end. When it's all said and done, all the people that we don't remember from our past will be along in that non-remembered camp very soon. My books, my films, my live stream, your books, your memory, your love, your gifts, your belongings. Look at the things that you have in your closet. Look at the things that you have in your cellar, your attic. Look at the things that you have in your consciousness. The memorabilia of a lifetime soon to vanish. And it will vanish. It's vanishing now. It may not even exist on a particle level. And here we live in the phantasm of the hologram and we cling and we grasp and we narrow into the myopia of the suburb call me and my life, my needs, my fears, my body, my aneurysm, my death, my mortgage, the me, 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 mine, mine, mine. Let's break the coma of the myopia of now. And remember that we are a life force in a wave of freedom, a galactic wave of liberation, if we so choose to participate in the states of mind that give life to freedom. Know those colors on your heart, my teachers would say. What gives life to freedom? Be that freedom, invest in that freedom. Why? The greatest gift that we can give life is the freedom to breathe, the gift of life the gift to love. The g Think of the times that you've made love, the joy and the bliss of that being touched and touching, the revolution of intimacy and romance, the splendor of eroticism multiplied times the fragrance of eternity. Go there. Giving our best to life gives the future of life the best chance to experience the best of evolution. Isn't that what we're here for? is to gift our life for the betterment of the evolution of life. So may I invite you to invite me to invite our friends. Let's not forget in the moments of stress and difficulty that we have purpose. All of us have meaning. None of us are small. But remember those unborn creatures, animals, trees, whales, birds, hawks, eagles, even the insects, even the goddess of Haleakala, the goddess of the universe, the unborn child, be a doula of the future. So from my heart to yours, a few of the life lessons that have been on my heart for the last couple of years, specifically the last few months, and come what may, so be it, never give up. So hope to see you soon, tomorrow, God willing, 9.30, and on Sunday, with Mr. Stephen M. Shore, we will have round talk two at 9.30 a.m. here from Hawaii on the power of the plant, the transcendence of the pandemic, the most honest edge that he and I can speak to about the context of what's happening around the world at this very moment. So please tune in, bring your friends. The closer we stand and feel in solidarity as a digital world Dharma Sangha, the better we are to, I would call it, join the revolution and fight the good fight. The war is on. From my heart to yours, thank you. See you tomorrow at 9.30.